Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with Canadian jazz saxophonist Joel Fromm. We caught up with him to talk about his new trio album called The Bright Side, featuring Joel on tenor and soprano saxophones, Dan Loomis on bass, and the great Ernesto Cervini on the drum kit. It is their debut recording for Anzic Records, and it's the culmination of a musical partnership that has developed over the course of many tours and recording sessions spanning the last decade. He opens up about this project and his life in jazz. Enjoy. Thanks for taking a minute out to the show. Of course, of course. So let's talk about Bright Side. And what I want to know is it's coming out during, you know, I know especially in Canada there's still a lot going on with COVID and, you know, America's kind of opening up. Things around the world are in different places. But what are your thoughts on a new album coming out now? I mean, it's been a long time since, you know, musicians have been able to directly communicate with audiences. So how does this uh, new release make you feel? It feels it feels good. I mean, it, it you know we recorded it about a year and a half or two years ago. I mean, before all of this happened, and so uh, it feels like it's kind of been a long time coming. And it was it was on, on hold for a long time. Uh, we had recorded it, and then the virus hit, and uh, and it really just sort of put everything on the back burner. Obviously, and uh, I actually got sick too. I, I I had COVID early on in 2020, and and you know was lucky to get through it without any after effects really. And and then, of course, you know, the, the, after after being sick, uh, I think for many of us, you know, in addition to the awful physical effects that it's had, I think one of the one of the biggest challenges uh, for most people was just uh, getting through daily life and feeling like, uh, you know, we're yeah, everything is sort of on hold and up in the air and and uh, not on solid ground. Um, so to be able to you know release this record and you know feel feel good about. Um, Performing again and and hearing these tunes play, played on the radio and getting response from the audience is, has really been gratifying. So, what do you ultimately want the listener, those that buy or download this album, to get from this artistic experience? You know, I think I think that I just want them to to enjoy it. I you know I I, I put these new songs out there. I, I I I guess the thing that I'm most proud of is the fact that. Um, this is the first record that I've ever done that's entirely made up of original compositions. Uh, there's seven of my songs, and then there are three uh, by the bassist and drummer, by Dan and, and Ernesto. You know, I basically just want people to to sit back and relax and enjoy it. You know, I, I, I don't know that there's anything that they need to bring to it. I just hope that they like it. You know, this is um, uh, was a special thing to to be able to uh, you know put some new new songs out there and i just hope that yeah i just hope that people that it may, maybe brightens their day a little bit and and uh, that they enjoy the music so this trio came about after a master class at the university of toronto talk to me a little bit about the history of the band and how the interplay works so well yeah, well, we, you know, I've been playing with Ernesto for many years. You know, we, I, I played in his quartet first. He, he actually, uh, I think what was in school uh, in New York City, uh, it's gotta be, I don't know, 14 or 15 years ago at this point. He called me to do his senior recital, um, which I did. And he enjoyed that. And so then he started, um, you know, calling me to do some gigs up in, in, uh, Canada. We would do these little tours. Uh, he would get Canada Council grant money and we, we would go out quartet. Uh, generally with uh, Adrian Ferruja on piano and Dan Loomis on bass. And then, of course, recently he expanded the quartet to include uh, William Karn and Tara Davidson on trombone and, and, and saxophone and alto saxophone, and that became a sextet called Turbo Prop. So my experience with Ernesto uh, especially, and Dan really in the same context, is very extensive. Um, we've done a lot of touring. Uh, we have a long history of playing together over the past decade and, and decade plus, really. So it seemed very natural, especially after we played trio at this master class at, at University of Toronto. It felt like a very natural thing to do. And, and the guys in the band, I mean, uh, Ernesto and Dan were so excited about it that they said, hey, you know, would you allow us to book the trio? Um, we'll do the booking if we can use your name as a leader. I said, yeah, you guys go ahead and do that. That's great. You know, they booked a European tour for us, and we had this amazing European tour, which went to Tbilisi, Georgia, and to, um, you know, France. We played in Paris, and we played all, all over Europe, really, for, over the course of about 14 days a couple years ago. And in return for, for them doing that, I, I, I thought, you know, I'm going to try and pay it back and, and uh, you know, make this record under my own steam and, and uh, have these guys uh, be a part of it. And so that, that tour uh, really sort of was the fermentation process for a lot of these songs to become what they became on the record. So how did you get the jazz bug? How did all this begin for you? 
Um, well, it began because uh, my dad, who is uh, now a retired journalist, uh, we've been living in uh, Racine, Wisconsin, and he uh, had written for a paper there called the Racine Journal Times. And then in the mid '80s, uh, he was offered a job in in uh, Connecticut at the Hartford Current, and uh, moved the whole family out here to West Hartford, Connecticut. And I ended up going to a high school that had this really amazing uh, jazz program uh, with uh, that was headed by the uh, late jazz educator Bill Stanley, who was this real sort of force of nature uh, educator and had this incredible high school big band that was always on a very high level. As a result of that, he had there started to be a tradition of, of students uh, that could really improvise uh, coming through. Um, I sort of was in the middle of that continuum, um, and it started with people like Pete McGinnis, the trombone, trombonist Pete McGinnis, then through uh, the tenor saxophonist Pat Zimmerly, and then I was there with Brad Meldow, and then after me, there were people like er Erica Von Kleist and Noah Preminger and Richie Barche. So there's this whole... Um, you know, long list of, of students that went to this high school that sort of all discovered, uh, you know, the history of jazz and, and got excited about listening and learning how to play that language. Um, it really became a culture in a certain way at this, at this high school. So I was lucky enough to sort of latch on uh, to this program at a certain time at a, you know, very uh, impressionable de developmental time, and that's how, that's how that started. So who would you cite as influences, those that really inspired you to play the way you do and see jazz the way you do? Well, you know, obviously the, 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 the huge one uh, probably mo that most people would, would point to is Charlie Parker. I mean, I think that's sort of a, like a musical forefather for a lot of jazz saxophonists. But then, you know, there are a lot of offshoots and disciples of Charlie Parker, you know, in, in direct and indirect ways. I mean, Sonny Rollins was a huge influence, Dan Getz. Is a huge influence. Johnny Griffin is a huge, very, very big influence on me. Uh, guys like Joe Henderson, Wayne Shorter. And then, of course, you know, there are the non-piano players, I mean non-piano players, the non-saxophone players that also uh, I get very, very inspired by. I mean, obviously, Miles Davis, but also people like Ahmad Jamal, Cedar Walton, you know, Charlie Hayden, Ornette Coleman, uh, Duke Ellington, you know, Count Basie, Lester Young. Coleman Hawkins. I mean, you know, it really, all of these people have had really indelible, an indelible effect on my musical, uh, you know, career and, 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 and my musical spirit. So um, I'm always trying to uh, somehow pay tribute to them in, in a small way by, you know, I, I often will say in my master classes, if, if, I, if I can shine a light on the people that created this music, if I, if I can, if I can, you know, you know, tell a young student, hey, if you like the way I play, you should go and check out Lester Young, and they actually do it, then then I feel like my job has been, <laughs> has been successful. So um, that's that's what I'm trying to do is to try and and educate people as to you know this incredible art form and this incredible pool of music that's been created over the last hundred years or so. What was the first live jazz show you ever saw that really made you think, man, this is this is what I want to do? I remember going my first trip to New York City as as a young adult. I I went in uh, and I saw Ray Brown Trio. And actually, it, it, this kind of was a cool full circle full circle moment for me just recently because I went to see Ray Brown Trio with the great uh, pianist Gene Harris from the Three Sounds and um, and also uh, Jeff Hamilton on drums. And it was so incredibly swinging. I went to the Blue Note to see these guys, and Gene Harris was just unbelievably bluesy. And I think there was something about that night, seeing those guys play and hear, hearing Gene Harris play the blues and hearing Ray uh, and, and Jeff swing so hard. That was one of the moments that really sticks with me from back then that I heard something that just really completely knocked me out. Yeah, I would say that that, that was certainly one of them. And, and it was cool. Actually, recently I was out in Cincinnati playing uh, organ trio with, with Jeff Hamilton, who I've gotten to know. Uh, over the years, so that you know that experience was probably I don't know over 32, 33 years ago at this point, and um, you know it's been nice to actually get to play with some of my mentors that uh, I was inspired by, uh, you know, early early on in my musical development. So, what do you like the best about being a professional musician? Well, I think I think the thing that I like the best is is just having the horn in my mouth. You know, there's 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 something um, there's something something about the relationship when I get on stage and I, and I, you know, there's that expectation of, I don't know exactly what I'm going to play, but there's the excitement that maybe painters feel when they see a, when they see a blank canvas, it's, 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 it's the, it's the opportunity that's there and you don't know exactly what it's going to be. 
at the time. But that's the exciting part is the anticipation that, that you have this sort of blank canvas, which is silence. Um, and you get to fill it up how you're going to fill it up. And, um, and I think that that moment of, uh, you know, the audience waiting, being up on stage, you know, you, you, you start, you start a song and you start to feel the, the way the band feels when it swings together. And then things just sort of start to tumble out of, of, of you as an impro improviser and you tell a story. And there's nothing really better than that. I mean, I, I, you know, I know that just the feeling of having the reed vibrate in my mouth and, and feeling the horn resonate and, and, uh, and delivering a story to people and having them, you know, you can feel sometimes palpably when, when an audience is really listening to you and, and it's, it's coming out just at the right pace. That's a, ma that's a magical feeling. I mean, that's about as good as life gets for, for me. So when we do return to the stage, when you get up there and we're in the crowd, what do you hope we all realize about the, the, the power and majesty of live performance? Well, I just want people to have a good time. You know, I, I, want, I want people to come out and, and enjoy it. You know, I, I want people to groove and, and feel, you know, feel the, you know, put a smile on their face. I mean, if I, if I play the blues and I, or I play something that swings and, and, or I play a ballad and, and make it really pretty, um, you know, that, that's really all I, I just want people to, to, to enjoy it and to, to, you know, sit back and experience it the way that, that they experience it. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not trying to preach to anybody about, oh, you should be feeling this way when you listen to me. I mean, there are going to be people that don't like it too, and that's fine. Um, but I, I just, I, I just hope that if people come out, um, that they go away feeling like, um, wow, those guys really gave something to us tonight and, and they really put it, put it, on the line and, and, uh, and just, you know, played their hearts out. You know, I mean, the, the, the one thing that I've always want to guard against is apathy. Like I never want to go on stage and just sort of like, you know, give a, uh, you know, a half, a halfway performance. So, you know, I, I hope that people take away, feel, feel like they're somewhat fulfilled by, uh, by hearing, hearing jazz and, and hearing, hearing us play. Everyone has a perception or an idea of who they think you are, your family, your friends, your fans, but ultimately you're living your life. Who do you think you are? <laughs> who do I think? Who do you think you are? Um, who do you think you are? Um, I, well, I, I, th I think, I think like most, like most people, you know, I, you're on a journey and you're, you're, a work, you're always a work in progress. And the, one of the real perks and privileges about playing jazz music is that it's um it's an endless deep well of of inspiration and so what's really cool about it is that is that I can come back to the same songs over and over again over a period of 30 40 years and find new things uh within this form and 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 there's something very timeless about that you know there's something very timeless about the fact that I learned how to play the blues at age 16 or 17 and it it gets ever deeper every year and that that is not just musical but it's personal too so you know, I think the the more uh, discoveries I make as a human being, just about living each day better than than I have in the past, I think that that really informs the music too, and it's all this big symbiosis. So, you know, I think if if at my very best, I'm evolving. You know, I I, I hope I hope I'm getting better as a person and as a musician, and and if I'm if I can do that in some you know small way and see you know good results over a, a longer period of time and that's 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 who i hope i am beautiful joel thanks for taking a minute out for neon jazz good luck with the new album and the return of the stage man oh it's my pleasure thanks for having me thanks for listening and tuning in to another neon jazz interview where we give you a bit of insight into the finest cats in canada kansas city and spots all over the world giving fans all that jazz and thanks to joel for his time music and story if you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino in the iTunes store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com and for everything Neon Jazz all the time, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.